This episode is brought to you by Dragon Ball Legends, the ultimate Dragon Ball experience on your mobile device. Dragon Ball Legends features action-packed anime action RPG gameplay with Goku, Vegeta, Trunks, and all your favorite Dragon Ball characters. Summon your favorite characters from popular Dragon Ball anime series, such as Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball GT to Dragon Ball Super. Fight in real time against friendly or rival Dragon Ball players from across the globe in live PvP battles. Enter ratings matches with your favorite Dragon Ball characters and earn rating points and rewards. Unite with friends to defeat powerful foes in co-op. Dragon Ball Legends features the best anime fighting scenes on your mobile device. And now, Legends Festival is on, so you can get up to 300 free summon tickets. Are you ready? Download Dragon Ball Legends today. Available for free on both iOS and Android devices. This is where we jump to a woman who starts to, like, just out of nowhere, Don Estes has appeared talking about pathogens and diagnosing illnesses. And then this woman appears talking about how she wants to have a career and have children and Caroline's response to her is I'm going to introduce you to my friend and we'll see what happens <laughs> <laughs> it totally does <laughs> seems deeply inappropriate right <laughs> god awful movie 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because we can't help it, apparently. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath and Eli are off having family time or some such, but sitting 4,000 miles to my east-northeast is my good friend, Michael Marshall. Marsh, welcome back. Oh, hey, Noah. You know what? I may be 4,000 miles away, but I'm closing my eyes and I can see you perfectly. I can see where you are. <laughs> I can describe the room that you're in. It works. It's good. It's you all can good. You move tiny pieces of paper in my environment. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. And sitting approximately one football field, regardless of which football we're using, I guess, to Marsh's North is cancer cell biologist, science communicator, co-host of Skeptics with a K and vice president of the Merseyside Skeptics Society, Dr. Alice Howarth. Who is, I believe, making her first appearance as a GAM guest mescus. Dr. Alice, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Very excited uh, to inflict this movie on you. <laughs> it was quite an infliction, but I have very much enjoyed watching it at a very slow pace. <laughs> yeah, no, this is it's one of those things where it's always fun to have done it, right? Never fun to do it, but to have yeah, done it. Absolutely that. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so tell us, Alice, what will we be breaking down today? Well, we watched Superhuman, The Invisible Made Visible. It's the documentary that tells you that you too can be as positive as the Doctor in Star Trek Voyager if you just wear a visor like Geordie LaForge and read children's <laughs> books. <laughs> <laughs> that's all going to make sense by the end. Believe it or not, that's literally what's coming in this film. And Marsh, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love explorations of the outer limits of human possibility but you want them hosted by someone literally too stupid to outwit a six-year-old, <laughs> you will love <laughs> this movie. Not... The funny thing is, this, we don't, the bar's not even set that high. She doesn't have to outwit them. She just has to fail to be outwitted by them. A yes. tie <laughs> in witting would have been better than what she managed <laughs> with. That it is absolutely true. <laughs> she oh. failed so badly. Oh, it's so much fun. Uh, is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, I'm going to go right in there with best worst blindfolded children. What? Now, <laughs> to be clear, that might sound like a weird category. And it's weird that this category keeps coming up on this show. But this mm -hmm. time it's genuinely, <laughs> genuinely relevant because they blindfold some kids to get some kids to do some magic stuff. And it is the greatest thing ever. I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil it too much. But I, I will just say that it will be, it's only technically true to describe these children as blindfolded. It's just barely technically true, but yes. it's not accurate to describe <laughs> them as blindfolded. No, there are, they have blindfolds on, yeah, right? They have Their access bodies. to a blindfold. Yes. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, I was going to go with best worst remote viewing. We get a, a full-on demonstration of somebody trying remote viewing for the first time, and it's 
like genuine. It's like it's what that really they didn't cheat at all. And boy, does that show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my best worst is the magic tin foil. Uh-huh. Marsh has been texting me for days because I watched the, the film after Marsh watched it. And for days, he just kept texting me saying, you've got to get to the tin foil. Keep watching and get to the tin foil because the tin foil <laughs> section is entirely delightful. Oh, it is. It's the absolute best. If they had wrapped it around their head to stop the alien signals from coming in, it would have been less silly than what we actually <laughs> got. Yeah, that is genuinely true, actually. Because I guess tin foil can deflect some stuff. And right. I, yes. Know, there's some amount of things it can deflect. So it's good for, but like, yeah, the the way they use it is even dumber than that. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really quite an achievement. All right. Well, I am dying to unlock our superpowers, as I'm sure you are. So we're going to keep the break brief, and when we come back, we'll dive into all the credulity that is superhuman. All right. You guys ready to record the podcast? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but first, we should talk about my underwear. Right, um, Alice. Okay, I probably should have explained. Um, there's this thing called a podcastiverse, um, and it it's kind of like a, a psychosexual fugue state. No, 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 Marsh. I'm talking about me undies. Me undies has the softest and most breathable underwear and loungewear that I've ever experienced. Whether you're on the grind during the work week or posted up on the couch watching Christian movies, me undies is here to keep you comfy. But Noah, have you actually tried them? I sure have, Alice. MeUndies' signature tense micromodal fabric is as soft as a warm hug from your favorite sweater. It's breathable, stretchy, and oh-so-comfy, making it ideal for all-day wear. Plus, MeUndies' fabrics are light and breathable to help regulate your body temperature so you stay cool and comfy. That's why I, No Illusions, personally endorse MeUndies. But Noah, what if I order them and I don't like them? Well, if you're not happy with your first pair of undies, it's on MeUndies. All right, Noah, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? To get 25% off your first order plus free shipping, go to MeUndies.com slash awful. That's MeUndies.com slash awful for 25% off plus free shipping. MeUndies, comfort from the outside in. Great, thanks. What was that about a fugue state? Did you not see Carl in the living room? Oh, yes, I did. Yep, there you go. Yeah. All right, everyone, welcome to the first writer's room meeting for Superhuman, the Invisible Made Visible. Uh, hooray! Woo! Now, as you know, it has been my singular goal to expose the true limits of human abilities ever since my uncle proved to me that he could conjure coins from my ear using nothing but the power of thought. So I figured we could do this movie, right? So we would just go around and film all the experiments that show that people have psychic powers. Well, that sounds easily enough. Yeah, right. So um, do you guys know anybody with like superpowers that they could demonstrate? Mm. Oh, um. Oof. Oh, my cousin Larry can pull his thumb completely off and then reattach it. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Wow. My, my grandpa can do that with my nose. Amazing. Well, between that and the sorcerer that I met at my niece's birthday party, we should be all set. Sorcerer? Yeah, he linked two solid rings together like it was nothing. Wow. Right? Do you think we should maybe also bring in some skeptics or magicians that could examine the protocols beforehand and ensure that we're not being fooled by parlor tricks? No. Sure don't. Mm -mm. No, me either. So solid rings, you say? Yeah. Yeah, he like banged them together beforehand and everything to show how solid they were. And we're back for the breakdown. And we're going to open up on, and I know it sounds weird to even point this out, but it has to be said, the longest production logos in the history of production. Oh, my God. The, like this one credit logo was up for 19 seconds. <laughs> yes. That is how you pad out your runtime. <laughs> With some lovely, like weird gonging in the background as mm -hmm. well that was just mm -hmm. really disconcerting. I think that was only there to make you just realize that it wasn't that the pitch is frozen or right. that the video yes. stopped yes. working because yeah, yeah. nothing else was happening for so long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but eventually we get the title, Superhuman, The Invisible Made Visible, which sounds like an instruction manual on how to catch Miles Morales, but no, it's <laughs> dumber than that. <laughs> Even less useful than that, I guess. <laughs> the opening question of the movie, the narrator comes up and says, what makes people feel fulfilled? And I'm like, turkey, stuffing, cranberry, mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the American's perspective. I don't know. 
How about you guys? And this again, I mean, I've said this before on the show, but I, I honestly think you should have to pass like a background check before you get access to stock footage library because it just gets <laughs> abused right. so badly in this movie. Oh. I found that the stock footage, particularly in this intro bit, made me feel really sick. It was just like had these weird cuts and it was fading in weird and made me feel really nauseous. Although they did have some diversity. There was like this random black woman that just appeared under the words, finding out who you really are. Mm -hmm. And she had this like really intense skin smoothing filter on her face and like this green plant on over next to her. And I was like, is this who she really is? (laughs) (laughs) So I'll just say, Alice, you shouldn't start by saying how sick the stock footage makes you feel and then immediately talk about the black person that you saw. (laughs) Crying space falls out like a little bit. (laughs) So yeah, so we're getting this random mix of just hippie pablum and random like science stock footage mixed with uh, meditation stock footage. But ultimately, she lands on, the narrator lands on, our mind is in constant communication with un seen forces in unknown worlds. Yeah. And as a podcaster whose Facebook messenger is open to strangers' messages, that landed hard with me. Yes, I'm <laughs> constantly open to communication from weird places. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah. Uh, so the, you've made a whole podcast out of that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> oh, and we should put out, too, so as we're hearing all of this nonsense, we're watching these kids playing a game of Dad Just Got a Drone. <laughs> <laughs> in their backyard. They are, but they're all wearing blindfolds. They're running with blindfolds yes, uh-huh. on their foreheads. They're lying in a circle with blindfolds. They're all wearing blindfolds. Yeah. I didn't even spot that they were blindfolds. I didn't even, all I thought was these kids are just playing the world's most boring games. Maybe the blindfolds <laughs> are to stop them realizing how shit the games that they're playing actually are. <laughs> yeah, I didn't catch the blindfold this early either, but, but we're going to, don't worry, we're coming back to those blindfolds. But first, we're just going to have these like three little British kids telling me how to attune to my energy, right? Yeah. Oh, and it's so it sucks so much when it's the kids yeah. like brought up on this nonsense. Like me and Alice, we went to a flat Earth convention years ago now, and like it was like the ten year old kid there was asking gotcha questions to the scientists, and all the adults around them are applauding and loving it, and you just think, oh God, just keep the kids out of this, please. Yeah, right. No, there was a there was definitely a moment here, and we're pretty much still in the credits here, where you go from like tee hee hee to oh, these kids are being psychologically abused. Woof. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a creepy quasi cockney kid, like an Essex family. And out of nowhere, he just starts, this kid starts talking about the man that he met in an alley who speaks in energy. And I, yes. like, I hope this kid is imagining that. I really hope this kid is imagining that. <laughs> he said he had ever since he'd been playing with this, this guy in his head or somewhere else. And he looked so concerned and had a really sad, weirdly cockney voice. It was, but it's incredibly odd. Yeah. It really, it felt like we should be calling someone, right? As we were watching this, like, there's got to be a government hotline or something. And then we get an Einstein quote, which, of course, like all Einstein quotes, is something that Einstein never said. (laughs) Yeah. This is the thing about how everything is energy. And it's like, Einstein didn't say that unless you count the time that the medium Daryl Anker channeled Einstein via an alien spirit named Bashar, (laughs) which is where that quote really comes from. (laughs) I I, I appreciate that they only gave us the first half of the quote, right? They give us everything is energy and that's all there is to it. Sounds just like Einstein, really, in in its cadence and everything. But the rest (laughs) of the quote is even dumber than that. What is there? I didn't even look up the rest oh, of the I, quote. I don't remember, but it's it's nah. trust me, it's even it's, <laughs> it's 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 about how like if you vibrate at the right energy, you can manifest anything you want or some That's such. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it does sound classic Einstein as channeled through an alien spirit named Bashar. <laughs> you say that kind of thing all the time. That was very him. No, it was. And now we're going to meet our narrator, the the filmmaker. This is Carolyn Corey, whose little Chiron comes up and says consciousness science researcher. <laughs> consciousness science researcher author was the full yes. Chiron, oh, which just right, doesn't right. work as a flow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, like, yeah, that, that is a title that very specifically isn't scientist. It sounds yep. like it's yes. sort of being scientist right. without ever actually saying scientist. It's so weird. There's no legal protection on this term at all. <laughs> <laughs> so she explains that as a five-year-old, she realized that she could read energy auras and hear other people's thoughts she could feel like emotion like emotions of adults like emotionally sensitive five-year-olds aren't 
a common thing. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> now, but also, like, she's just describing stuff she imagined as a five-year-old child that she now believes true as an adult, like stuff she was making up then. She's like, and I assume that was all real. Yeah, absolutely no evidence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, and she is the absolute poster child for asking bad questions, right? Oh, yeah. That was almost going to be, that was going to be my best worst until we got to my best worst. I had best worst <laughs> if statements because all the way throughout this film, she starts the things by saying, if something insane, then, and it's like, yes. no, just stop there because the right. if statement has already proven a negative. Your, your if has already been crushed under the weight of your then. Yeah. Just. <laughs> she, she says that this way, she says, when we sense that something's there and nothing's there, what are we tapping into? What are we coming into contact with? J nothing. 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 <laughs> no. Absolutely nothing. And her next question, her very next question is, how does telekinesis work? <laughs> so. <laughs> but didn't we see Corey Feldman at the time that she was saying that? It made it sound, because she said, you know, when you sense someone in the room and you're alone, but it showed a clip of Corey Feldman. And it <laughs> made it feel like she was arguing that that's when we all tap into Corey Feldman. Like that's the answer to that question. <laughs> so I didn't notice Corey at this point, but don't worry, he's coming back too. <laughs> he is. Yeah, I completely missed him here as well. <laughs> so, and and then we get we get this little montage of just, and we're gonna see all of this later in the movie, but just this hilarious, dumb experimental shit that Marsh has probably played along with at some point in his career. <laughs> <laughs> Had so much fun with that. All right, so then we we cut back to the blindfolded kids. This is when I first saw that they were blindfolded, and and they're demonstrating their psychic powers by doing things blindfolded, like playing ping pong and reading books. Yeah, and at least here we very quickly get the answer to the are they deluded or just lying conundrum. Yes, because it's really clear they're faking this. Like all all of these blindfolds are half the height of the child's head, but for some reason they're all balanced on the nose and not actually covering all of the eyes. So they're just yeah. peeking. They're all like slightly too high, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, even if the blindfold does work, the children are reading children's books. My niece is three; she can't read yet, but she can still like read pages of her favorite books because she's fucking memorized the lines. Of course. Of course, of course. Yeah, there's like 16 words per page, but also we don't see the words, so we don't even know if he's getting them right. So. No. <laughs> and she's trying to find like a scientific appro approach to explain how this ca kid can cheat as obviously as he is currently cheating, <laughs> that this is not real psychics. Well, and yeah, because he's holding the book like down way below him and sort of he's got his head cocked to one side so he can see it. Like, it's so obvious what he's doing there. It's it's a move that I that exact move is something that I once saw James Randi do when he stacked a deck of cards without breaking eye contact with the person over the table. He was able to like look out of his peripheral vision sure. and put a deck of cards in order. If he could do that, these kids can read a book they've already read <laughs> out of the peripheral vision beside their nose. Right. And as for the ping pong, like even if he can't say that's just the person that's hitting the ball back to him, hitting it exactly the same spot. Every, like, right. That's not even a thing. That's nothing. And the kid's leaning back really obviously. So he's just peeking. That's this is yeah. just peeking that like we could just turn the film off. All the children filmed in this with the blindfolds have just weird cricks in the necks. Like the yeah, right, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so strange. Yeah, it's not just that these Cockney kids have all got like rickets or something from uh, from two little <laughs> vitamins in their diet. Yeah, it is weird when a blindfold proves that someone's not a shut eye. But yeah, that is what we see in this scene. <laughs> and then we meet Dean Raiden, the chief scientist for. Ions, apparently. Is yes, what it, the Institute of Noetic Science. Oh my fucking God, is that what that is? <laughs> yeah, noetic science. I, I, I thought the etic was silent on that, but yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and God, I've never seen Dean Reardon before. Dean Reardon is a name from way back in Skepticism. Oh, sure. When I first got involved in Skepticism, his name's been floating around. He's a man so committed to the idea that Psy is real that even like the lovely Professor Chris French has written about him in a scathing fashion. And you've either <laughs> got to do something really bad or get Chris really drunk before he'll do anything like that. <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah, no, I hadn't seen him before either. I've, obviously, I've heard the name, but yeah, he apparently mm. he looks like he looks like the version of Salman Rushdie who's endangered by blasphemies against the Star Trek canon. Right. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but he has got a PhD, which Alice means he is exactly as qualified as you are. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely a hundred percent. Although his his PhD, like his master's degree, is in electrical engineering, and then he went on to do a PhD in educational psychology. And then has gone on to do this this stuff for this show. Right, yeah, no, he's... That is a weird career transition. That is right? not a bog-standard career transition. It's very odd. Yeah. Yeah, but he tells us here that he has studied thousands of psychic kids, right? And then we also, we briefly meet Ben Hansen, ex-FBI agent and just researcher, just in general. That's this guy, right? It just says, ex-FBI agent researcher. <laughs> right, but is that just researcher generally, or does the X bit also refer to the researcher bit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. I feel like the, the ex-FBI agent bit is put in just to impress people, and I'm not going to mm -hmm. lie, it did kind of impress me a little bit. I did go, ooh, ex-FBI agent. <laughs> right, no, he must be legit. No, I'm with you, I'm with you. And, then, and he goes like, he's like, I've studied hundreds of EVP recordings, and that made me so sad. Like, you only get to <laughs> Live once, Ben. You just listen to static <laughs> hundreds of times. Man, that's sad. He says he's captured dozens to hundreds examples of EVP. Right. But he didn't play a single one. Like, nope. I want to hear these voices. Mm -hmm. They are not going to sound like voices, are they? They're not going to sound anything like voices. Not remotely. Well, if, no, but if we put subtitles up, you'll kind of hear the thing that we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Carolyn comes in and she's like, you know, there are actually many credible institutions that study all of these things we're talking about. And I'm like, yeah, I bet you're not going to quote from the credible ones though in this movie. Are you? <laughs> yeah. I think it's also, she says, and the CIA ran a project for 20 years researching this. It's like, yeah, do you want to tell us why that's past tense, Caroline? Because <laughs> I don't imagine it's because it was really successful. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's the, definitely this implication of like, you know, even the U.S. government spent millions of dollars on this. And what are the odds that the U.S. government would just waste millions of taxpayer <laughs> dollars? Come on. The U.K. government has literally spent like $7.94 billion on PPE that was unsuitable and unused. Oh, God. Like, governments waste money on bullshit all the fucking time. Yeah. 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 Although I'm not sure, like... Carolyn Corey says that these are the credible institutions and governments around the world dedicating so much research and funding into this field. You would think there's something there. I'm not sure my example there of the, the British government is what we would call credible right now. Yes. Yeah, no, even she could see that and she can't understand how a child with a blindfold on can look down past their nose. And right. she would recognise that our government are a bunch of charlatans, yeah. I love, there's also this moment where we get this guy like trying, like he's going like, well, you know, the Chinese are studying it and the Russians are studying it and the Japanese are studying it and the Israelis. And I'm like, is this the argument from we can't allow a psychic gap? Is that really what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> we're six minutes into this movie before MK Ultra comes up. <laughs> yeah, it, it comes up from a guy called uh, Major Paul H. Smith, PhD. Yes. And they really do just give PhDs to anyone, don't they? They're, just, they're worthless. They're a waste of everyone's time. Must be very easy to get one of those things. Yeah. So yeah, and we're, don't worry, we're going to come back to Paul Smith because he's fucking hilarious. Areas, but <laughs> but first we're, we were going to meet Tom Campbell. He's a physicist, and I got to say, like physicist, first real job title in any of these chirons, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's like that's a real thing. Definitely more qualified than I am. Like physics is definitely more sciencey than biology. Oh yeah, yeah it's got particles and neutrons. Yeah, <laughs> he's also he's the author of the, of my big toe, the trilogy, <laughs> which it took me ages to realize is not a, like an extended ode to his feet. But <laughs> It's, it's T-O-E, it's theory of everything. But they don't, mm -hmm. A, they don't make that clear. And B, his case isn't helped by having a giant big toe on the front of his fucking book. <laughs> just to really, he's just trying to hit both markets. He's trying to get the people who really did want a book all about toes, who then buy it. Oh, and then are go. disappointed, but not so much that they get a refund. Right, no, they, 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 they go like, well, let's see if the second one has more toes in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But he explains that he was just a physics student and then he meditated once. And I'm like, oh, that's the gateway drug to woo right there. <laughs> there are so many examples of people who've gotten into woo through going to graduate school and then finding some talk on meditation or mindfulness. And um, that's how we talked about this on Skeptics with a K once that John Kabat-Zinn, who's like the father of modern mindfulness, he got into it by, by seeing a Buddhist talking while he was at university. Yeah. yeah. 
This is why we shouldn't let Buddhists talk. I mean, half the time they do it for <laughs> us, but some of them do, do break that vow and it goes to, to no good places. Right. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> so this is also where we first introduced this dumbass, the physical world is a derivative of consciousness concept that's going to undergird this entire movie. It's like, man, at least come up with some original bullshit. And then we meet Dr. Eben Alexander III. Eben Alexander, I've got to say it right now. He was episode 53 of Be Reasonable. Oh, was 2018, he? I've interviewed this <laughs> fucker. <laughs> oh, he's like, I had an NDE. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, when you're loaded with drugs and your brain is misfiring, that's where the real cerebral magic happens. <laughs> yeah, like normal people, when they almost die, they get scared and go religious. Noah, what happened? What happened? Where, where was your conversion, Noah? <laughs> Did you even really have a heart attack? <laughs> yeah, they start saying, they, they, it's like everybody's competing with the dumbest possible way of explaining solipsism, right? They're like, consciousness is primordial. I'm like, my brain hurts, man. <laughs> Carolyn says, consciousness is fundamental. What? Yeah, let's stop at the if. It isn't it. Like, <laughs> rocks aren't conscious. Are you arguing that rocks don't exist because they're not conscious or wouldn't exist if we didn't exist? That isn't how this works at all. This is ludicrous. She literally says that the world is not in space or time. It's before space and time. <laughs> it's just all complete psychobabble. It really <laughs> is. Yeah, so we power through a bunch of that. And then we meet Dr. Rudy Child, astrophysicist. Which means that this person is going to have a lot to say about how the brain works. I did have at this point, you know, crazy billionaire money. This film, exactly as it is, but I'm in the room for each interview. And I would take it. I would absolutely <laughs> oh, take shit. it. Yeah, no, so would I. I'd finance it, man. <laughs> yeah, no, but he explained, this guy's an astrophysicist, so he's going to tell us about consciousness. Because you know how, like, I'm a podcaster and that has sound in it, so I can play the mandolin? It's like that, <laughs> right? Because they're both science. <laughs> He says, and I quote, consciousness can be described by the quantum attribute. <laughs> 10 minutes in. I would have set the over under it too. So that was good. There's 10 <laughs> minutes in before we go quantum. Yeah, this is, this is where I wrote that. This was all about consciousness, but this movie was going to be a challenge to my ability to stay conscious because this was really <laughs> dumb. Yeah. He goes, you're a piece of consciousness playing an avatar in a game called the physical world. And I'm like, that's literally, that means nothing. That's absolutely <laughs> nothing. But he was talking about like avatars and simulations and then called it like this physical world as if it was like all in capitals, like, like it was the second life game rather right. than like. <laughs> yeah. And this is where they had the if statement, you know, if the physical world exists within consciousness... No, no, we'll just stop there. We don't yeah, need to finish the rest of that no need sentence. to finish. Consciousness exists within the physical world. You've got it the wrong way around. This is emerging from the meat. That's all. And I love it too, because they have this like group of people that are just in front of this gray background that all chime in here. We don't know. None of these people get a Chiron. We don't know. This is just, you know, I don't know, the, the top 10 GoFundMe donors or whatever that are chiming <laughs> in. But they're all saying different shit because she's asking them about the simulation hypothesis. And some of them are like, yeah, yeah, no, that totally fits with my bullshit. And then other ones are going like, no, my whole thing is you create your reality. So that doesn't actually work for me then. So, yeah, there's one smug guy who's like simulation or uh, the Matrix. And I wonder about like, maybe you've heard of it. It's kind of a big deal. <laughs> it, was a, it was a whole thing. <laughs> and then we get a shockingly insubstantial Tesla quote. Here's the quote. <laughs> And I, I think Tesla says, I couldn't find anything that debunks it, but who fucking cares with this quote? It says, yeah. life is an equation incapable of solution, but it contains certain known factors. Yeah, this <laughs> okay. is so fucking boring. It's basically saying, we don't know all the things, but we do know some of the things. Brilliant. I mean, all this, all this quote, all this Nikola Tesla quote tells me is that there wasn't a better Nikola Tesla quote. That's all we yeah. can learn from that quote. <laughs> Oh, God. Then this guy comes in to explain to us that everything is waves of consciousness, but matter waves are round and consciousness waves are spiral. I don't fucking know. He just starts talking about like spinning and rotations. And I genuinely just tuned out and stopped listening entirely. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, is that none of her talking heads can get more than 30 seconds in before they're just blabbering meaningless science words, right? So it's it's a tough one to stay in. Yeah, all I was thinking was about the consciousness waves that go in a spiral pattern. I was just wondering where, I think in Australia, they go in a spiral pattern in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, luckily, there's a visual cue for this, too. When, when he says uh, when she says consciousness waves, we see a young white lady meditating so that you understand what we're talking about. Yeah, which is the main role of women other than Caroline in this, essentially. They're, <laughs> really? they're not there to share a lot of their thoughts. There really are not many women on the, in this program. No. There's also a point as well where they say, starting with the global spin of the universe. Okay, well, that's not global then, is it? <laughs> 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 yeah, but they try to make a big deal out of this that like, you know, the universe is spinning and subatomic particles spin and it's like they that's just the, what we call that it's not they're not actually spinning mm. it's like but but it's so it's all connected and i'm like in that it all can spin okay <laughs> but also what's the alternative you know, it's not remarkable that the the movement that we're seeing in the universe is rotational movement because it, if it was all linear movement everything would have right. fucked off by now yes. <laughs> <laughs> all, <have> gone away. <laughs> all the linear stuff's long gone we just don't even yes. know about it <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, and she goes like, this is again one of these just Herculean ifs. She goes, if the world is based on spin and consciousness and the waves can connect two minds, I'm like, just, <laughs> you're done. We're done now. <laughs> but she does say at one point, she's like, how could we prove this? And we're like, oh, that's actually a very good question. And she's like, with anecdotes. And I'm like, oh, not a great <laughs> answer. Damn it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, how can we demonstrate that in real life? Well, I'd probably get like an 80s, 90s child star to talk into a voice recorder while some Cockney children <laughs> peek out from the gap beside their noses. But you do it your way, Caroline. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we're going to re-meet Paul, the, the guy who claims that he was once a psychic spy for the US government. <laughs> he spied on the Soviets with his mind. I just, I kept expecting this guy to go, but that's when I accidentally unleashed the Demigorgon, you know? Okay. <laughs> all right. I, I was just enjoying all the pictures that we saw of him throughout his life. We're just seeing his lifetime of poor eyewear decisions, essentially, <laughs> yes, all the way through. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like the huge glasses that he's wearing in the last of photos, those would have actually made better blindfolds for the kids than the ones they were actually wearing. <laughs> I just, there, there's something about a guy with, I don't mean to make a fun of a person for his, his disability here, but like there's something about a guy with Coke bottle lenses saying he can do remote viewing that just doesn't sit right with me, right? It's like, why wouldn't you just yeah. use that then instead of the glasses? And I'm, I'm not mocking him for his poor eyesight as well. I'm mocking him for his poor taste in eyewear. Like, right, yeah. Six, he six, looks six, like he's six. in the second Elton John lookalike division of the military. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they, they were a specific brigade that would only fight on Saturday nights, I think. Right, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, but and he's like, you know, this remote viewing stuff that I did for the for the CIA was very powerful. I'm like it's so weird that a stage musician once taught me how to do it. Then it's so weird that they can <laughs> also do that. And, but but in case we're still skeptical, he presents a letter that proves that at one point some high ranking official was fooled by this, right? This is the thing I just find so completely baffling about this spy stuff is that they, they seem to think they, it makes them sound more legitimate that they're spying on Russia using psychic powers. But if you frame it from the position of it not working, it's just so silly that yes. they think, I can think what the Soviets are up to <laughs> to the point that high level government decision is affected. It's just yeah. ridiculous. And it, it's amazing because they, they show a picture of the remote viewing stuff and it's like, oh yeah, they, they were thinking about where the, the missile was going to be. And he, and you can see he wrote down as his like picture of where it, where the missile was being hidden, rough curving building with gray matte concrete exterior. Yes. So yeah, it was a gray building that was like curving and he drove like a little round kind of shape. But yeah, of course the missile was in a building with a round hole on top. That's the kind of hole, that's the kind of shape <laughs> hole that you yes. fire missiles through. It wasn't <laughs> right. any star shaped like you get on top of one of those, to uh, those kids toys that you've got to push the blocks through. You were trying to get a <laughs> missile. <laughs> yeah, no, we already had Silo, man. Come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's like, I'm, I'm guessing it was one of them, but over there. That yeah, right, right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, you can tell from the picture that there's a road nearby so that narrows it down <laughs> and a mountain in the background some birds flying so yeah so and then but don't worry this is going to get so much more delightful because we're now going to meet actress producer and inspirational speaker rachel brooke smith who is going to learn how to remote view herself in this movie 
Yes. And they, they introduce her as actress, producer, and inspirational speaker. Her listed film credits on IMDb are Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Squeakquel, <laughs> Beat Bar, The Movie, Cycle Stripper, and Help My Gumshoes, An Idiot. But... Not listed on her on her Wikipedia page, rather. Not listed on the Wikipedia page. This movie. So this movie was lower down her CV than Help My Gumshoes an Idiot. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. Unless Help My Gumshoes an Idiot is an alternate title for this film. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Rachel's like, I believe so much in all our superhuman abilities that that we have that are untapped. And, and, and she's like, oh yeah, no, this, this chick will be perfect. <laughs> So she brings her into the remote viewing to Paul, the remote viewing guy, and he's going to give her some intense training. Now, if we had gone in and intentionally drawn the silliest possible shit on his whiteboard for the term intense training, right? We couldn't have done better than what's actually there. There's a stick figure of a unicorn and there's like fish and clouds that some child drew a few nonsense scribbles. It's, it's amazing. All, I'm, all I can assume is he was remote viewing like a four-year-old in a different room who was like, that's who he was channeling uh, for those drawings. I also, it's a really small moment, but I also love that when Caroline walks in and talks to the remote viewer, he asks her, where he saw her last. So <laughs> could you, not have, <laughs> you couldn't have got that one yourself, mate. <laughs> so. I, I enjoyed Rachel and Caroline sitting on the sofa next to each other wearing exactly the same outfit. They both had long <laughs> sleeve, like bluish coloured tops with black leggings, black boots, long curled hair. I'm sure one of them had to remote view the other to get like the exact same look. It was identical. <laughs> There you go. Either or Rachel was like in preparation for playing Caroline in the movie <laughs> of this movie. <laughs> so yeah, so now they're going to try a little remote viewing. Uh, now that she's been, you know, now that she's been trained with all those squiggles and and uh, horse stick figures, she's going to try out some remote viewing for herself. So Carolyn is going to go somewhere and she's going to remote view it. And it's just everything about this is so fucking delightful. Starting with what he, at the very beginning, he goes, so just uh, Rachel, just describe what you're experiencing. And she goes, OK. And then she says nothing for so long. They have to cut. <laughs> <laughs> and we all, we see like Caroline go off to the location where it's going to be remote viewed. And I, I wrote, I'm pretty sure Rachel's going to draw or describe a circle because everything in the location they choose is a fucking circle. Everything. Right. It was so weird. Like circles yeah. everywhere. Yeah. I've never seen anywhere with so many circles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, clearly they're trying to get a place that's going to like, it, like where everything's going to match. So we have this bit where we're interspersing the shots of Carolyn at this location with the shots of Rachel making incredibly vague statements about those places that are mostly wrong. Yeah, that we just have to like <laughs> accept their pinky swear that this was happening at the same time. Because if it wasn't, it's also completely meaningless. Like yep. if Rachel was saying stuff when Caroline was at a different bit and they've edited it together, this whole thing falls apart, which is what definitely happened. That's clearly what's happened here. Right. But what's so amazing is how bad they still do. She goes at one point, she's like, well, you know, I see laughter, which isn't a thing that you see. But but <laughs> but they, she's at a merry-go-round, right? Carolyn's at a merry-go-round, but it's an empty merry-go-round. There's nobody there. There is no laughter. They pipe mm, in yeah. the sound of laughter and post, but they it, unless it's Carolyn cackling to herself outside <laughs> of a fucking merry-go-round, where would that come from? She says, I see black lines. And I'm like, oh, wow, a location with black lines. What are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> but all that she goes, I see something red. She's holding something that's dense. Well, if she's holding it, it has to be a certain amount of dense, doesn't it? I love this part so much because she said that she's holding something black and they uh, Paul asks her, how does it feel? Does it have a texture? And starts asking these really leading questions mm -hmm. to describe this thing. Yeah. Um, and then she says, oh, it's smooth, but rough. Like what? the the really precise <laughs> description of a thing that is both smooth and rough. Yes, yes. Just give us the entire spectrum of tactile <laughs> sensations. Why don't you? 
<laughs> somewhere between smooth and rough. Oh, well, that's pretty accurate. He goes, he goes back away and she says, I see mountains. And I'm like, well, you know, she's in the fucking mountain. She's only been gone for half an hour. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like they left the stage. Like they put her straight on like a, a jet engine to fly her to another country. Or something. Right. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> We also, like, this is just the stuff that they show us, but we actually see a clip at one point where we can see her notes. And I paused it, and she also wrote flowers, pink, levels in structure, and textured. But we don't get to see her saying those things because flowers and pink and stuff didn't land. And right. so they just ignored them. This is just, you know, picking out the bits that hit. This is cherry picking. She wrote genuinely like pages and pages and pages. Right. Yeah, there's like four pages of stuff that we see and like a third of a page of stuff that we hear. Yes. Yeah. And, and how much of what she said that we actually see in the, the, the movie here, how much of that applies to the environment immediately outside of your house? Because I was thinking about this and I, I could make almost everything fit to the streets in a, in a sort of a, a block or a, a several blocks of from where I live because it's just so generic. Sure. Well, the one thing that couldn't fit was where she says she's she's getting something hot, a drink or a liquid. And she says Starbucks. And Paul says... So you wrote it down. You can let it go. It's like, okay, so he thinks she's wrong. He knows where Caroline is and he's asking <laughs> right, these and leading questions <laughs> and Starbucks is wrong. <laughs> yep. Well, and the one big hit, this is so fucking funny because at one point she goes, there's noise. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, wow. There's noise in the environment that she's in. <laughs> what are the odds of that? And by the way, she's wrong. It, it would have been like, you could not have found a more silent environment to be in. And then she says, there's Christmas lights, which... Seems like maybe that would be really like a good, like a hit, except it's clearly Christmas time. Yeah, yes. it is. Yeah, 100%. Because <laughs> the Christmas lights are in the big Christmas tree. And I'm like, well, that's, give me a fucking break. If I said right now you're somewhere with Christmas lights, that would narrow it down to America or Europe, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like she might as well have written in her remote viewing, um, I'm seeing that the weather outside is frightful. <laughs> So, but then they, after she's done all of this, they drive to the place that she was remote viewing so they can all like try to fit the shit she said into the environment, right? Like, like she walks up to this, there's a bit, this big guitar sculpture and she's like, oh, you know, I said noise. This must've been what I was seeing. (laughs) Because <laughs> it's representative of a thing that makes noise. It's a, a statue. It's a silent statue. Yes. But because it's a guitar, therefore noise. Right, that counts. Yeah. She's like, and you know, I said I saw red and many of these buildings are made of brick. <laughs> They're made of bricks. <laughs> One of like the six materials used in, in house right. construction. <laughs> And then there was the bit where Caroline like sat down to block her as well. So they get to the bit where it's like, and then I found it really hard to see where you were. So, oh, that must have been when I was blocking you. Mm, that's because the blocking works. Well. <laughs> Why would you block her while you're doing this? So how dumb. would you block her? How? Because he says like, could you try and block her now? How? How do you try and me, block me, someone me, me, reading me, yeah. your location? <laughs> But Paul knew that he, she was going to do that because he, in the in the video recording, he said, right end, like, okay, so you're done now, right end. And then they take that as proof that that was when she started blocking her was when she wrote end. Right. <laughs> he told you to write that. Yeah, let's just go ahead and hack that P while we're at it. Yeah. And then she goes, she goes, look, I even drew bars and they show what she drew. And it's so obviously like the facade of a shed or something. like, that's not bars. She says, I said gray and black bars. I'm like, no, the fuck you didn't. You said black. She said, you said black, dense object. Jesus fucking Christ, this is bad. (laughs) They did, however, confirm that she did go to Starbucks. But this is when Paul confirms he did know the location because he says, when she said Starbucks, I thought, oh, crud, did they stop at a Starbucks? I told them not to take side trips. So he definitely knew the location and led her the whole way through. Absolutely, yes. It isn't even pretending to be science. No. That is a bad way of doing science. It absolutely is, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 if any study should be double blinded, God. <laughs> it's really hard to double blind a remote viewing experiment. <laughs> you keep peeking around the blinding all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, that 
that's it. Is he's so good at remote viewing, he couldn't help but know where they were. Yeah. Yeah. It just reminds me of something. There was a, um, uh, Uri Geller once lied for a long time about him being a remote viewer for the Israeli uh, military service. And there was a documentary on him on television about him being a remote viewer. And I was watching it with my wife, Nicola, and they showed his house and how it's got to be all like covered in security because of how high level his work was. And Nicola said, he's got a lot of CCTV cameras for a man who made his living remote viewing. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, the physicist guy comes in to babble his conclusion in science words. He says entanglement. So there's more quantum bullshit for you. So I guess the people who are playing drink every time they say quantum probably need their stomachs pumped at this point. That means we need to take a quick break. But we'll be back in a minute with even more superhuman. Broccoli? Those are trees, Alice. Why would I eat a tree? I see. Hey, guys, what are you doing? We're just working on some diet ideas for Noah. Yeah, she's trying to make me eat trees, Marsh. Trees. Well, if you're looking for for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days, you should try Factor. What's Factor? Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. It can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, you'll eat well, and you'll stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. I don't know, Marsh. Those meal boxes often end up being more trouble than they're worth. Fact is, fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you've got to do is heat and enjoy. Two minutes? But do they have variety? They sure do. Choose from 35 or more weekly flavor-packed, fresh, never-frozen meals that support a healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences, all delivered right to your door and ready to eat in two minutes. Two minutes. Marsh, we heard you. It's in the copy, Alice. I've got it. Anyway, head to factormeals.com slash awful50 and use code awful50 to get 50% off. That's code awful50 at factormeals.com slash awful50 to get 50% off. All right, Marsh, I'm in. As long as they don't try to make me eat trees or grass. Grass? He means lettuce. It's it's flat grass, Marsh. You guys should know this. Mar- Alice, you're a doctor. Got it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hey, folks. Just wanted to cut in with a huge thanks to everybody that chipped in to make Vulgarity for Charity such a huge success again this year. We had a matching donation up to $150,000 this year, and our goal was to squeeze every penny out of that, and we did. It came down to the wire, but we ended up blowing past it on the final day for a grand total of... $330,609 and... 30 cents, apparently. This is our fifth year doing Vulgarity for Charity with Tom and Cecil, and in that time, we've raised $1,584,339 for families on the brink of poverty. We've helped hundreds of families, thousands of people at this point, and along the way, we've reminded the naysayers that atheists have hearts, too. And when I say we, of course, I'm including you. This is a community achievement, and we should all be proud of it, even if you didn't donate this year. Just by helping us build a community, you are playing a part. So again, thanks. Be sure to listen for plenty more roasts to come on Cognitive Dissonance and The Scathing Atheist. And remember that even though the fundraiser is over, it's never too late to donate at modestneeds.org. And we're back for more of this shit. And apparently we're doing chapters now, right? Because the title screen comes up and it says chapter two, a physical body with non-physical abilities. I'm like, we never got a, was there a chapter one heading that I missed somewhere? (laughs) Also, a physical body with non-physical abilities. That's just someone thinking, isn't it? Yeah, like sure a is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I appreciate that to this movie, thought is a novel concept, but they shouldn't just out themselves <laughs> as openly as that. <laughs> so yeah, so we're going to, we're going to check in with the Institute of Noetic Sciences now. This dude's going to demonstrate the effect of intuitive abilities. And I wrote in my notes, I'm like, like the way that I can tell this test is going to be bullshit or some other kind of intuitive ability. <laughs> but it's got a data visualization going on. So Alice, you know, this is proper science. <laughs> this is the stuff that you do. This is as valid as your research. <laughs> this is nothing like the stuff I do. Oh. <laughs> I can promise you that. So what they're going to do, they're going to measure some dude's pupil dilation to see if it can predict the type of picture that is coming up on their roll of pictures. Yeah, this is the Daryl Bem intention experiment. This was like a very famous experiment that Bem argued that 
people reacted to a shocking image before they saw the image and that there was something that was sending a signal to them in advance that it was coming. And he argued that this was something that proved Psy was real. Now, obviously, other people have tried to replicate it and it hasn't proven to be replicable, which just means that whatever Ben was doing was messing it up somehow. That's what he's doing here. But it's quite a famous experiment. It's just also bullshit. Right. But they're using like the track, measuring pupil size from a laptop on a desk quite a long way off away from the eyes like that's not how you measure pupil size pupil size you have to be like up close to the pupil they they don't change that much yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) and it's it's also important to bear in mind that the people in the person in this experiment is being heavily told up front that a shocking image is coming Mm -hmm. right because he's like very primed for it which also fucks up the experiment right because like what you want to do is to have people out of nowhere taken aback rather than Mm -hmm. oh is it the next one no it could be the next one the next one could be the one like obviously people are going to start anticipating it after a while this is just completely ruining the experiment well and also the clips are all the same length of time so he knows that okay four seconds it's about to change oh i sure hope it's not shocking yeah such a dumb thing yeah yeah but he he shows us the the lines afterwards he's like look at these lines it totally worked and we're like oh okay (laughs) And then, so based on that, the narrator asks, this is one of the weirdest questions she manages. She basically says, does our pupillary psychic ability to predict pictures give us the ability to alter our DNA? (laughs) 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 The fuck kind of transition is that? (laughs) DNA, unless we're getting towards biology. (laughs) Yeah, no, this is biological, right? (laughs) This is where we meet Dr. Glenn Rain. He is a professional dropper of liquids into brown jars. (laughs) I do enjoy seeing some actual pipettes. It does feel like actual (laughs) science. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it does. And it's actual science. This guy is at Harvard and Stanford, although if you look him up, he also published on the effects of the mega chi pendant on blocking cell phone radiation from harming the body. (laughs) So they really do just give anybody a PhD these days. (laughs) So yeah, so he's going to talk to us about our ability to change our body's pH. And I'm not convinced that Caroline Corey knows that there isn't a relationship between pH and PhD. I think she (laughs) thinks those two are the same. I can make myself smarter. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, so we're going to watch as she psychically changes the pH balance of water, right? So he puts this little water and he's got this, I, I guess, pH measurement device. I don't fucking know. It's it's a pH meter. I have used pH meters a lot in my lab experience. And he, uh, she asks the question, can you explain how this instrument works? And in my experience, they fucking don't. That's not true. <laughs> they, do, they do work, but they require really delicate calibration, recalibration, maintenance. It's a really sensitive instrument that requires like care and maintenance and being used properly by people who know how to use them because they can be really temperamental. I, what I really love, Alice, is I'd written in my notes that she holds her hands on the sides of the glass of water, which slightly warms it up and warming up liquids can change its pH uh, levels. And you've written like an eight line takedown of my <laughs> body. Like you are debunking my ass in the middle of it. <laughs> We've got to get the science right, Marsh, because they're not going to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Somebody has to. <laughs> But yeah, she's like, I was going to focus on lowering the pH. And she puts her hands near the water and we see that the pH lowers. I'm like, okay, now focus on raising the pH. No, (laughs) we're done. Are we really done now? (laughs) How about focusing on lowering it more? Oh, can't do that either. Weird. (laughs) Just going to move on to the next experiment, which is apparently um, (laughs) he's going to measure her ability to psychically change the conductivity of DNA. Yeah, this very much confused me as to what was going on here. And especially since we see we see him like do a test with her and then says like, oh, yeah, we'll call that. um, We'll call that control one. We'll just call that control one. I don't know what they're measuring. I don't know how they're measuring (laughs) it, really. I don't know what this machine does. They just kind of. Also, we don't even know that it's a sample of DNA. Like, we know that it's an open dish of solution with, with the words DNA written on the side. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we definitely know it's DNA because it's he's put a piece of tape, masking tape over it and written yes. DNA on it. By <laughs> Duh, Marsh. Is that not how you would it's deal with DNA samples in your uh, research office? 
<laughs> I mean, to be fair, most of my labels would be handwritten in in labs, so um, I, I can't really <laughs> criticise them for handwriting their their labels in on tape, but. I'd, I'd write something more specific than DNA. Just, yeah, <laughs> you'd probably close the the lid of the container of the yes. very sensitive DNA as well, lest it become like polluted by anything else, including your hands, which are really close by it. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. So they've got this like it's like a, a Coke bottle lid. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, that's good. just got DNA written on it, and she's gonna wave her hands over top of it, and some lines are gonna change on a graph. He never tells us what these lines are, what we're fucking measuring here. I mean, he says we're measuring conductivity, but what though? What what specifically are these measurements? We don't fucking know, right? No. And he does, they do three tests as like the baseline control with him sat next to her. And then he's like, okay, now we'll do a real test. And he gets up and leaves. It's like, I feel like you should be in the same setup, given how close you are together to make this like as legitimate as possible. You don't like leave and change or change like many of the parameters of the area. Well, right, right. And, and she puts her hands right next to it in the uh, after the control. I'm like, well, then your hands should have been next to it during the control, right? Yeah. Like you, you, you could have put your hands there and not focused on changing the conductivity of the DNA, maybe. But your hands should have still been there. Yeah. But from this, he concludes that we can heal ourselves without drugs. And he even says, quote, and that's considered legitimate science. <laughs> <laughs> Legitimate science. Alice, I noticed you never introduce your field as legitimate <laughs> science. You know, it's never like, hi, I'm Dr. Alice Howarth. I've got a PhD in legitimate science. Actually, it is legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. He goes, you're changing the molecular level, but you're also changing the quantum level. And I'm like, this guy shouldn't be allowed to have beakers. Man, that can't end well. <laughs> What are the odds that's going to end well? And we see we see another stock clip at this point. And it, it, because he's talking about her intent and her consciousness, when we see this like stock picture, it makes it look like her intent and consciousness is levitating a 1990s Christina Aguilera lookalike, which is what we're seeing <laughs> at this point. And I thought, at least when it comes to, if you like submit stuff to a stock image library, could you at least specify no bullshit in the license? Is that a thing <laughs> you're allowed to do? Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, but but he concludes that because you can change the conductivity of DNA with your brain, you also don't need medicine. That's all a scam. Jesus. There's so many leaps here. He goes from, like, <laughs> changing the conductivity of DNA with your mind and then just out of nowhere is like, oh, yeah, and, and changing the DNA conductivity makes your DNA heal faster. What? With completely no, like, just out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> the lack of transitional steps in this movie is staggering. Yeah. Yeah. So and now it's time to talk about ourselves. Now, this is the part where they just roped in some poor actual scientist, I think. Right. I don't I'm not going to vouch for this guy's legitimacy, but nothing he actually says in this documentary is wooey. They just, you know, prop up woo next to everything he says. Yeah, as far as I can tell, he's just a real scientist who researches a fairly new area of, of cell biology, looking at vibrations of cells using a particular type of microscope. And he does not seem to realize that he is just being used to support woo here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, come out in uh, in defense of the cell biologist, Alice. You know, you guys have got to stick <laughs> together. What a coincidence that you're not going to criti criticize the cell biologist. <laughs> yeah, this is Dr. Jim Jimzuski. He is a biochem professor at UCLA, and he he explains that his research involved listening to yeast cells buzzing, apparently. Is this where he says something about during 9-11? Yes. Uh -huh. Right. I can't remember what it was, but I remember thinking it was very weird to drop 9-11 in there. Like he was looking at something and then 9-11 happened. And so he started looking at yeast instead. It's like, mate, you can just study yeast. You don't have to justify it via an atrocity. Just, <laughs> yeast is interesting. It's funny. <laughs> Yeah, and he says, but what we found was that the yeast cells were making different sounds when they were sick, and then and we hear these sounds, and it comes up on the uh, on the screen and says actual sound of cells, <laughs> and I'm like, no, because I'm made of cells, I would have noticed that sound. <laughs> Alice, you've had real cells before. Is that what cells sound like? You do have to tell us. <laughs> To be fair, I used to talk to my cells all the time because when you're in the lab at three in the morning, you go kind of bonkers and I would <laughs> talk to my cells, but they never talked back. So I never, I never heard what cells sound like. They didn't sing. There wasn't like a five part harmony going on with various different cancer cells. <laughs> 
So yeah, and then he it, it, with we also point out like that planets make the same sounds as cells when we run them through the exact same types of filters or whatever, uh, which is I guess supposed to be some as above so below type justification. No idea. They don't explain like any of their justifications for anything. They just leave them there for you to fill in your own gaps, which I guess works if you want the woo people watching your video to go, oh, okay, that does make sense because they will fill in their own gaps. Clearly. And it's so great, this poor guy, because Caroline just keeps asking him just mad stuff. At one point, she just asked him this completely crazy question. And he's like, I mean, yeah, we can influence ourselves and others, if that's what you're trying to do. That's as far as he was willing to. <laughs> yes. It's like, we can influence ourselves and others. That's, that's as far as he was willing to commit. <laughs> Way to go, Dr. Jim. Yeah, and because apparently he was just too damn credible, we then switch to Randy Masters, whose Chiron identifies him as harmonic mathematician. Yeah, he doesn't have a PhD. Also, his name is not a description of an MSc in course in fucking. That is not what Randy <laughs> Masters is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he says, our, and I quote, our resonance can cause consciousness effects in others. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> like, if I vibrate really close to you, I can wake you up, I guess. Yeah, you just I don't, <laughs> shake them awake. <laughs> <laughs> And then all of a sudden, fucking Michael Dorn appears. Yes, that Michael Dorn. Fucking Worf shows up to go, I don't know. I think if you think positive things, that's great. It's so weird that Worf is in here. Like, at one point, <laughs> I'd written down, why the hell is Worf in here? Spoiler alert, later, he will literally ask the same question. Yes, he will basically yes. come on and go, I don't know what I'm doing here. It's like, yeah, man, <laughs> neither do we. <laughs> And uh, so, and then he's followed by actor Robert Picardo, who like was one of those like, where do I know him from, guys? For me, yeah, this was the the doctor in Star Trek Voyager, I think, wasn't he? Okay, all right, yeah, okay. a little too deep in the Trekkie lore for me. And so, okay, and then we're ready for Chapter Three: Thoughts Made Visible. No, we will not see any thoughts in this chapter. Spoiler, I guess. But. <laughs> well, there is a CGI woman doing yoga who has fireworks coming out of her head. I don't know. Oh, if that that's no. Okay. Like... That's... <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected. So, yeah, he, she says at the beginning of this, she says, We know that our intent, our thoughts, our emotions affect how we feel. <laughs> they are. Yes, and... Synonyms we, tend to do that, love. Yes. What can I tell you? <laughs> She's like, you know, saying things affects the body. And I'm like, well, yeah, right. Like when I say, I bet I could jump that high and I end up needing a tetanus shot by the end of the night. That's an example of, <laughs> of that happening, I guess. But this is where we're going to learn about voice frequency imprints from one Don Estes. Right. Is this where they say some people analyze your vocal imprints to find toxins and pathogens in your blood, but then they immediately move on and just find and just go on to a different thing entirely about a guy who's looking for visual patterns in your voice? Like yes. you don't get to, get to like smuggle a crazy thing in by immediately shifting to a different thing. You can't be like, <laughs> oh, well, we can use this as magic. But anyway, we're not going to talk about the magic. So don't think about it too much. Don't <laughs> right, examine that exactly in any kind of way. <laughs> Well, this is where we jump to a woman who starts to, like, just out of nowhere, Don Estes has appeared talking about pathogens and diagnosing illnesses. And then this woman appears talking about how she wants to have a career and have children. And Caroline's response to her is, I'm going to introduce you to my friend and we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> she totally does. <laughs> So, Seems deeply inappropriate. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, but don't worry. He's not going to impregnate her on camera. Instead, he's going to read her voice frequency patterns. She is Karina, a um, professional dancer and choreographer. And so he comes in, he hooks her up to this machine and he's like, so tell us about, you know, something stressful. And she talks about her job and, and her, her desire to have a, a kid and, and still maintain her job as a dancer. And he's like, okay, so this this machine is is measuring your stress. It is again. This is an exact fucking quote: an intention manifestation machine. 
is what it what it is. Yeah, it, it makes kaleidoscope pictures that make your dreams come true. That is what this actually is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. And it's digital tea leaves, right? So as she's talking, he's looking at this just mass of random colored pixels going, mm, you can see in this line right here, the sadness. And we're like, no, you fucking can't, man. <laughs> Uh, I really wanted, as she's talking, and all the pictures are on screen, as she's talking, I just wanted it to all turn black, like jet black. <laughs> like maybe like a visible skull pattern, like a skull and crossbones appears. And it's like, ooh, I, I don't know what to tell you, Karina. Um, how, do I, how do I put this? <laughs> well, right, and, and in case we're not... And then like she talks about something that makes her happy and the random pictures suddenly have circles in them. Hello. So that's pretty legit. <laughs> It otherwise looks completely identical. Just the circles <laughs> yep. just appear. Yeah, that's the only difference. And then he's like, so say the word yellow. And she's like, okay, yellow. And the, all the circles turn yellow. And I'm like, you programmed this thing. Did you just program it to turn yellow when people said yellow? Because fucking Alexa does that, you know. But in case we doubt it, he proves that it also works with burgundy. So. <laughs> I don't trust that he hasn't just got a turn yellow button and a turn burgundy button because he picked those numbers, those uh, colors out, I think. Yeah, no, you're right. He did, he absolutely did. Well, what I love is, look, if this was a real thing, then what you do is you would isolate the two of them, right? He would look at the colors while she talked about the thing. And then he would tell us whether she was talking about happy or sad or yellow or burgundy things afterwards, right? But yeah. no, he's just pointing at the circles going, yeah, no, you can see the circles. That means happiness. Oh, okay. <laughs> Weird that you didn't mention that before the circle showed up. <laughs> but, but in response to this, though, of course, Karina offers up that profoundly privileged, you know, manifest what you want in life take that successful people often use to prove that, to themselves that it wasn't just luck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. She did. She did. I, I googled her. So this film aired in 2020, and she went on to have a child in April 2020. So I think it it works. Like power intention and magic voice pixels, like 100 percent true. Or oh, Don Estos fucked her. It's one of those. <laughs> you cut to her kid. It's all just yellow and burgundy pixels. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> so. But yeah, so and this Don, he he shares his closing thoughts. I thought his yammering was the least decipherable of all the yammering. I think he gets the prize for that. I don't know. I was just confused because he he put like a stuffed shark on her vagina while we heard him talking about this, and that's all I could uh, all I could spot was that she was lying on her back with a stuffed shark on her vagina while pressing her palms down on two sponges. But eh, it worked. I mean, it worked. She had, she went on to have a kid. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so then caroline pipes in for some more ex in, like just insane extrapolation where she's like you know the placebo effect and the double slit experiment prove that we can think things into reality i'm like that's not what either of those things prove <laughs> i was really worried they were going to go on a big placebo jaunt because if so you've got the wrong two members of skeptics with a k on this show for a big oh placebo yeah run. right <laughs> Neil House would not be able to do the Jew justice <laughs> can somebody tag in my but they, they didn't do that <laughs> they, instead they did the double slit experiment which i think is one of the things you've got to perform a double slit experiment as part of your randy masters i think that's like the, <laughs> the end exam of the randy masters <laughs> So yeah, so but yeah, she explains the double slit experiment in a way that proves that she doesn't know what it is or why it's meaningful, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, but it's very empowering to believe this. And I'm like, that you have superpowers? Yeah, I bet it is. <laughs> so our next uh our next talking head, this is Colin Harrington. He is, according to his Chiron, a sound engineer and inventor who claims that he can see his dreams in sound waves or some shit. Yeah, and I look this guy up and as best I can tell, he doesn't actually think or doesn't pretend he's doing science in any way. He just thinks he's making pretty pictures and pretty patterns from people's brain waves, which fine, I guess. Sure. I mean, if you want to do that as like an art thing, that's fine. Yeah, but she has to team him up, I guess, with another like D-list celebrity she knows. This is Naomi Grossman, who is, quote, the most creative actor I know. <laughs> and uh, she's going to they're going to take her to Colin for some kind of bullshit brain training that is so ill defined in the movie that I can't even tell what they were trying to do right yeah they've literally just like put an EEG on her and the EEG is linked up 
to something that that Colin has created that makes it show the brainwaves in a different way to the way an EEG would normally show brainwaves. And then they just have her think different things to show that you can change your own brainwaves by being more or less active. Yes. Which is how EEGs work. Right. How does yes. that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, and right in the middle of all of this, Carol just says out of the blue, wow, this is insanely accurate. <laughs> <laughs> accurate to what? <laughs> yes, in what possible way? She done thunk a picture up on that screen. What are you talking about? Oh, God. And then they do do the picture. They show her a picture and say, okay, think really hard about this picture. And then it's there. And he said, okay, I'm going to take the picture away. Now think about the picture again. And it comes back up. It's like, yeah, because you've just trained her. You've trained the machine to recognize what her EEG looks like when it's on this picture. But this machine isn't bringing up that picture out of all possible pictures when she thinks about it. No. It's just binary, that picture or nothing, or like not that picture. That's the only thing you're doing here. It's just a binary thing, image or not image. Yes. All right. Well, now that we know that we can manipulate our brainwaves using nothing but our brains, I imagine most of us need a minute to rethink our worldview. So we're going to take another quick break. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Can Carolyn turn invisible, but only when you're not looking? Can she fly, but only when she wants to and she doesn't want to right now? Can she phase through solid walls, provided there's a door right there and it's open? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the hilariously unimpressive conclusion of... Superhuman. Hey, Dr. Alice, thank you so much for agreeing to be in our documentary. Sure, I'm always happy to lend a skeptical voice. And and uh, we're always happy to add any person with letters after their name. Uh-huh. Uh, hey, what's the name of your documentary? The guy on the phone didn't say. Oh, the name <laughs> is for, for skeptical people is uh, Science, the Totally Real Science of Reality. Weird name. It's a working title. Sure. I just have to be careful that my likeness and reputation won't be used to legitimize pseudoscience or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, t totally. Me too. I wouldn't want that either. So um, are you ready to get started? Sure, let's go. Okay. Uh, so the camera's going to, you just look right at me here. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, what can you tell us about psychokinesis? That it doesn't exist. Oh, sure, but I, but it could exist. No, it would definitely violate the laws of physics. Right. Uh, but, counterpoint, quantum. I'm sorry, what does quantum have to do with, with psychokinesis? Well, you know, in, like in, entanglement, the slits and stuff. I'm not sure I actually want to participate in this interview anymore. Oh, no, we can talk about something else. We don't have to talk about that. Like, for for instance, can you read the words on that cue card? No, no, it's a demonstrably untrue claim. Okay, what about this one here? That one is too incoherent to even rise to the level of untrue. So that would be a... No. <sighs> okay, Um, would you agree that puppies are awesome? Puppies are awesome. Okay, but could you agree with that just by saying, yes, I agree with the thing you just said? No. Nope. Okay. Well, never mind then, I guess. I mean, I can say fuck you into the camera if you'd like. No, no, we got plenty of shots of real scientists doing that. <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action with Caroline explaining the implications of that last very impressive experiment that we just saw <laughs> where she says like, you know, if, they, if, if that guy could turn sound into pictures, that's just like sonar. And I'm like, no, not at all like that. And she's like, plus trees emit frequencies to warn each other about shit. And I'm like, what does that have to do with the other? And then she says, and I quote, if plants can communicate through invisible frequencies, can humans do the same? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. She said that while invisibly vibrating the air with yes. her vocal cords so that we could hear her. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yelling, watch out, Ted. That would be communicating through invisible frequencies, lady. <laughs> <laughs> but this is all an introduction of that ex-FBI agent Ben Hansen, the EVP guy from earlier. And this is also where we meet Corey Feldman. Oh, Corey Feldman. She does say Corey Feldman needs no introduction, though looking at him, he may need an introduction to a stylist because he was is a... wearing a real <laughs> choice of an outfit. 
His outfit is incredible. He has got like pink trousers, this like shiny silver shirt, pink tie and a pink trilby with Mm -hmm. like black floral lace laid over the top. It is such a weird look. Is that what that was? I thought it was like an art decor lampshade that he just like grabbed and gone with. <laughs> yeah, no, that outfit screams, I sure hope somebody notices me. <laughs> and this, this is, by the way, where I formulated the first law of Corey Feldman, whereby every time you see Corey Feldman, it will be in a manner that is sadder and more pathetic than the last time you saw him. <laughs> oh, that is Right, that, is that, 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 that is law accurate. went into effect about, I'm going to say, stand by me or so. Yeah. yeah, you know, like fucking Lost Boys was great, but it was slightly sla- sadder and slightly more pathetic than the last one. It just, it just, it's been going like that my entire adult life. But to his credit, though, he is not buying anything in this stupid fucking movie. (laughs) Yeah, it's so good. They bring him in for the EVP thing and he immediately calls bullshit. It's so good. He's like, I don't think that's (laughs) correct. And what the fuck was Ben trying to demonstrate with the blue and the red tape recorders? I don't know. I do not know. Because he like he takes the batteries out of one tape recorder, but then plugs like a speaker into it and a microphone like a, into, into the other one. And then he proves that you can get them to talk to each other if you have a microphone pointing at a speaker. I just, right. He's, he's like, you know, but this, all this has in it is a, is a coil and a magnet. And I'm like, that, that's a, you're talking about a dynamic microphone. Yeah. Right. That's how that fucking thing works. He's just like, wow, you can transmit sound from a speaker to a microphone using nothing but a speaker and a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing. And then when they do this demonstration and proves that you can actually get, you know, say something at the first dictaphone and then you can transfer it at the second one. Fine. He says, as you see, and all this happened without using radio waves. It's like, no, but it was using like electromagnetic frequencies of which radio waves are a subset. It's yes. like boasting that your omelette is magical because you didn't specifically use chicken eggs in it. <laughs> Therefore, this is a magic omelette. How do I make the omelette without chicken eggs? <laughs> All, yeah, it's so fucking bizarre that like literally I watched it twice trying to figure out, is there something more impressive that I'm missing or is he really just recording fucking microphone A with microphone B? And he is. That's literally all he's doing. And at the end of it, he goes, see, we just proved that sound waves can be transferred without physical contact. <laughs> Dude, what, did, what did you think before? <laughs> This whole section, they're just describing how things work. Like, we already, like, none of this is new or special or impressive. It's just science. Yes. He says this transfer, you know, he said, obviously, you know, this is energy based. Well, obviously, it's energy based. You've built a device that that generates energy that uses energy to transmit sound, and it used energy to transmit sound. You put batteries in it. We saw you put (laughs) batteries in it. talking about yeah so yeah no but we proved that sound waves can transmit through the open air that's pretty magical but don't worry he's not done yet he also has a thermal imaging camera that can prove that you can transfer your heat energy into the seat that you're sitting on Yes, and, and just before he introduces that, he leaves that, that previous demonstration by saying he can also just think about people and they'll call him. And I wrote, well, why wasn't that your demonstration? Because that is genuinely <laughs> interesting to do that. But instead, you're demonstrating microphones and warm asses on a cushion. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this was, I was about to say this was my favorite demonstration, but then I remember the tinfoil is still coming. So yeah, <laughs> he, he brings him to this room. He goes, as we know from the law of thermodynamics, and I'm like, yes, that famous single law there. He, and, and then he tries to he tries to say the first law of thermodynamics, but he screws it up so bad. He's like, as as we know from the law of thermodynamics, energy can ch- change into other shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we're, we're looking through this thermal imaging camera. We're looking at Corey and Carolyn sitting down in these chairs. And he's like, now get up and look, the heat signature from before is still in the chair. Yeah. Also, it is slightly awkward how when they stand up, both their crotches are just glowing with heat. That is a slightly <laughs> awkward, <laughs> awkward thing. 
Well, that's actually, that's not a thermal imaging thing. Corey's penis does that all the time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and they also point out that his hat is really cold. And then they talk about how we need to, to transmit positive energy. And I wrote, yeah, we need to transmit positive crotch energy into the world, not negative hat energy. That is the lesson <laughs> that we're learning from this. Well, and Corey goes, yeah, no, it really goes to show how our energy can affect everything around us. And I'm like, well, if you mean in terms of temperature, then sure. Yes, yeah. you're going to warm up and cool down your environment with it. And he this is he ends this experiment as well by saying about how, uh, you know, I'm going to believe that everything is fine and it'll all work itself out. And I wrote, yeah, that was a strategy that was successful for exactly 50% of child actors named Corey. Oh, Jesus Christ. Dude. <laughs> 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 but yes, but this movie goes straight from chairs stay warm when you fart into them to karma exists. Again, no intermediate steps. <laughs> They're like, you see, the energy stays in the chair even when you leave. And I'm thinking like, right, that's why my cat always steals my seat. I get it. And he's like, which means that if you put positive energy into the world, you'll get positive energy back. And I'm like, how? Yeah. <laughs> Take me there, man. You've had a whole movie. You got a whole movie. You're in charge of the script. Take me there. Yeah, every one of their arguments just uh, transfers from one point to another without any physical contact between any of the points of logic in those arguments. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how it works. <laughs> so, well, also, there's another great Corey moment, right? Where the guy's like, you know, and we capture these EVPs. No, I don't know if those are ghosts or aliens. And Corey's like, they're not ghosts. That's not a thing. <laughs> 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 but yeah, but there's a moment here where Corey Feldman explains the spiritual realm to me. That was the low point of my life. Then he starts to explain <laughs> atheism. And I'm like, stay in your fucking lane, bro. I got this. Okay. <laughs> Corey. <laughs> but then we get the gray background people again. They all come in to say contradictory shit. Yeah, including once we leave our meat puppet behind, we can go back to our actual true existence, which I think is my favorite line from the whole thing. <laughs> I also, I, 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 everybody says this, every woo person says this, but I have to point it out yet again. Somebody goes, you know, you can tell that something's going on bigger than ourselves. What is that? Yeah, like rhinos, for example, are bigger than us. <laughs> what does that even fucking mean? <laughs> Jesus Christ. And then we get a second stupid Tesla quote. This one, again, I didn't bother to check to see if he really no. said it. But the quote is, the day science starts to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than all the previous centuries of its existence. Weird that science <laughs> hasn't done that then. <laughs> so. Oh, by the way, fun fact, when you Google that quote, you get shit like the Institute for Noetic Studies and I shit you not, hugtheuniverse.com. <laughs> 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 but that quote it bleeds us into chapter four mind over matter i would think that the fucking quote goes after the chapter title but what the fuck do i know apparently <laughs> right oh uh, and i was so excited when i saw mind over matter i was like okay we're gonna get to the good stuff now this is gonna be the good stuff yes and it was this is fantastic oh it absolutely was it starts off with a clip of this lady bending a spoon using nothing but her hands <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, really obviously on camera. I don't even know what point they thought they were trying to right. make by showing that. <laughs> she, it's like, yeah, no, you can. That's the easier way, I guess, than doing it with your mind or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but she explains that there's the, this institute in Russia that will unlock your telekinesis magic for cash. I mean, there's a price, right? For that. Yeah, yeah. And it's a class that you go and you sit around what I think is like an institute that's fucking with people by getting them to have the biggest and weirdest glass shape that they can convince them to stare at. It's either that or they're keeping a very novelty bong shop in business with these glass shapes that are going on. And you just have to sit around these glasses and try to move things that are happening in, that, that are hidden inside the jar. And I wrote that the only thing that I want more to attend a class like this is to make Alice come with me. <laughs> it's for me to have to watch Alice attend a class like this. This would be worth going to Russia for, huh? <laughs> yeah, they've got all these guys and they're making, they're, 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 they've got these tiny paper swirls that are inside of glass enclosures and they're like, they, they start spinning and the guys are like, see, I did that with my mind. And I'm like, oh, can you stop and start predictably or on command? No, <laughs> no, I can't. Can you make it go faster or slower? And just occasionally it spins. Yeah. Yes. 
<laughs> I'm trying the whole time. Yeah, it's weird how the things that they can move with their mind, they're all things that are incredibly light to move. And they point yes, out yes, that in, yes. inside this uh, glass, you know, it's isolated from the environment kind of thing. But it's not isolated from, he said it's isolated from like heat and drafts, I think he says. Yeah. But uh-huh. it's not because... Uh, yeah, dra- drafts and like you you actually interacting with it deliberately. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But it's it's a sealed glass, like it's a closed glass. It is a perfect environment for convection currents. Yes. And that's that. That's all this is. You're, you're dedicating your career to not understanding convection. <laughs> so, yes. And so Sean McNamara, he is the meditation instructor, telekinesis guy. He's going to teach Rachel from before, the, the chick that did the remote viewing. He's going to teach her how to telekinesis. Which I, I and I have to point this out. She says at the beginning, she's like, "Well, you know, I'm a firm believer that you can manifest things into reality just by thinking of them." Because I watched a movie once and I realized that I wanted to be an actor, and with just a in a few years, I was actually playing a role as in the sequel to that very same movie. <laughs> Which means, as near as I can tell, that the movie that inspired her to act was Alvin and the Chipmunks One. <laughs> <laughs> right? It has to have been. It has to have been. <laughs> and, the, and the sequel that she was in was The Squeakquel. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but they're going to they're gonna produce movement with their minds. This is so stupid. Because I wrote in my notes at, at this point, it's like, wow, it's weird that Eli taught me to do this using nothing but static electricity. But I was insulting Eli and his craft because what they do is so much less impressive than the bullshit static <laughs> electricity trick that Eli taught me. Yeah, this, this is where they, they have like the, the tin foil uh, inside of a glass jar that they can move with their mind. And she says, I think Rachel even says during it, it really is like baking a cake. It's like, yeah, in that it's mostly achieved via heat and convection. Yes, it's exactly <laughs> like baking a cake. Yes, yes, he goes, as he's explaining to her, he's like, now um, you have to keep working at it uh, for sometimes for a very long time. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Until it does something, you have to keep going. <laughs> yeah. If you don't give enough time, it doesn't work, which is carry on until it does something. Yes. And then it works. <laughs> right. He gives like a million different like, okay, this might not work, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work caveats before they even start. <laughs> and then they put these tiny little pieces of tinfoil. They precariously put them on these little tiny pins. They put a glass jar over it and then they put their hands on the glass jar, yeah, thereby warming the air inside, and shit starts moving in there, and they go, huh? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's like they almost give it away because he tells them when you put the glass jar over, you've got to be really careful because it's really easy to knock the tin foil off the needles. Oh, does it move really easily, does it? It moves really, really <laughs> easy, does it, Sean? You've got to be very careful because it moves so easily. Take much. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'd really like to, to see them knock over the thing that's holding the pin that's that's got the tinfoil on because like tinfoil moves really easily when it's balanced on a pin like that. Yeah. That's not impressive. It's really not impressive. Show us your psychokinesis moving something weighty and I will be impressed. Or even, look, I don't even need that. Just stop it and turn it the other way, right? Like just yeah. go, okay, and now I'm going to go counterclockwise. That would be way more convincing than what we see. Right. Uh, at one point, they're like, "Oh, well, you know, you don't, you're not impressed by that." Well, what if she puts two pieces of tin foil poised on needles into the jar, and only the much lighter of the two moves? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we see it for like a like a quarter of a second. It's like a really short amount of time. Yeah. And then next, I just wanted to to be like adding more and more bits of tin foil, like Evil Can Evil with buses. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna use ten tin foils. <laughs> Yeah, but then they they wrap all of that up. Rachel's like, yeah, I had a lot of fun. And I'm like, well, that's the most important thing. (laughs) (laughs) She said she learned so much about herself. Right. Like... What you what you've learned about yourself is you think she talks about her love being involved. So she she's genuinely learned about herself that she believes tin foil can feel her love. Like, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'd want to know that about myself. I would want to know that about myself too. At least he can fix this character flaw. Yeah, right. (laughs) Knowing is half the battle. Right. So she says, yeah, no, I really felt superhuman. And because this movie is so stupidly made, they can't just let the title drop sit. Carolyn has to go, huh? That's the name of the movie. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so and so now we're going to meet Dr. Mike Willicky, 
in the middle of trying to phone a home, apparently, based on all this shit around him. This is Dr. Mike Willicky of Berkeley. Yes. And it's like, guys, you've got to be way more selective over who you let into like Berkeley and Harvard and Stanford because we're seeing so many of them and they're all not great. They're not great examples of those uh, academic institutes and their, uh, their exceptionalism. Yeah. But he's yet another, he's yet another fucking one who went woo when he was at university and went to a Zen center. Yeah. Like this route is so frequent. Like we need to understand what, ha- oh wait, hang on. Campuses. It's definitely drugs, isn't it? It's not the Zen yeah, stuff. It's all I the think drugs. It's probably the drugs. <laughs> yeah. He, he might as well have said, I met this hippie girl. We did LSD. Anyway, I can move things with my mind. Uh, right. Now, and I've dedicated right. 40 years to it. <laughs> yeah. He well, yeah, he gives us some the secret bullshit, you know, the participative universe model nonsense. Carolyn decides it's been too long since she had a Chiron, so she gives herself another one, right? During his <laughs> thing. <laughs> that was great. And he's like, yeah, so um, I can, it, yes, I can move things with my mind. Only if they're already moving, though. <laughs> this was such a bullshit experiment because he's like, yeah, I tried to make this paper move in a vacuum and, uh, well, that just didn't work. So. <laughs> <laughs> he said I tried it in a vacuum, but it's impossible. So I've added a little twist and the twist isn't magic. Spoiler, nope. it isn't magic. No. It's moving the paper. <laughs> It's that he put the speaker on, or he put the pin that's got the little piece of paper on it on a little speaker, and he's now piping noise through that. So it's moving on its own, but he's saying, like, I can make it move faster or slower. I just can't tell you which I'm going to do before. Exactly, yeah. Not predictably. <laughs> <laughs> I can retrodictively tell yes. you which way it's going to have gone. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, and Carolyn comes in and voiceover and she's like, well, obviously this is super duper convincing. We, you can see how we can spin tiny little pieces of paper that are on speaker needles with nothing but our minds. But can we do that via Zoom? <laughs> Yeah, she does it from like a thousand miles away. And she's like, oh, wow, it's amazing that I can do it. But like, how can she rule out that it isn't him doing it, given that yeah. she thinks he can do it and he's right there. He's right, right next to it. It's impossible. I just wonder how like they control for other distanced influences. Like what would happen <laughs> if I happened to be thinking about wiggling a bit of paper at the exact <laughs> same time? <laughs> They're really hard to control for, actually, now that you mention it. (laughs) (laughs) They show us the the results of this, which is us dramatically watching a line of paper jerkily rotate for a bit. (laughs) And we are promised this is in real time because it's obviously a separate piece of footage. But promise you, this is when she was thinking about it. Yes. uh, Yeah. But yeah, she but she gives her theory of how this all works. She says, I think our consciousness switches our brain from linear firing to 100 percent capacity. <laughs> uh, Dr. Alice, what does that mean? Uh, that you that's that's your like, right? Like that's biology, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, totally. A hundred percent real biology. The brain normally fires linearly and it somehow does, you yes, can sir. consciously switch it to 100 percent capacity. Which is non-linear, apparently. <laughs> Completely non-linear, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay. And then we get to our final chapter. We come to chapter five, real humans doing superhuman things. And this is where we finally make it back to the blindfolded Cockney kids. Oh God, it's so good. It's it's even, it's even better that they introduce it as real humans doing superhuman things. Not just like real humans doing obviously fucking fake things. Yes. Like so clearly (laughs) fake things. Yeah, she says, see, they don't need to, they can be blindfolded because they can read with every cell of their body, provided that the book is way below their eyes. <laughs> like at one point you even see the kids get like, asked to to look at something and you see the kid put the thumb on the blindfold and move it up a bit because it had slipped and they couldn't see yes. past it. So they just move the blindfold and no one stops them. Right. Well, and and in case you're thinking that at the time, Carolyn like puts the mask on and she's like, yep, I can't see a thing. This is all legitimate. (laughs) And she's clearly wearing it like lower on her face than the children do at any point as well. Like all of the children are wearing it like on their forehead, basically. She wears it properly and says, I can't see anything. Well, yeah, exactly. And the, the idea is that you can read with every cell of your body. Why does it have to be in front of your blindfolded eyes for you to read it? Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, she sits in the middle of the circle of children, like holding things up in front of them. It's like, why not do it behind your back if they're not looking with their eyes? Right, yeah. or behind their backs. Put it in a box. There's lots of solutions here. If you genuinely want to test this, you can really, really test this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. But yeah, so but she assures us that they could do this trick anywhere, except under controlled conditions, of course, by having the kids go grocery shopping. And so they're like, you know, find the, you know, Dawn brand dish soap. And we watch these kids like lay their head back like Neo is dodging a bullet to see <laughs> underneath that fucking mask. Oh, and this is where we meet uh, Nicola Farmer, who's the one who's taught, taught these kids uh, that. This is Nicola Farmer, the founder of ICU, which stands for Inspiring Children Universally, <laughs> which makes no sense. But it does mean that she started with the initials first, which makes even less sense because those initials were already taken by something quite famous. There's already an right. ICU yes. uh, knocking around. <laughs> oh God, I looked at her website. I want to meet this lady. Her website has cartoons of kids that are creepily blindfolded, like one of those catalogs that Andy Wilson used to pass around in that long running joke <laughs> that Eli used to do. <laughs> yes. And uh, I went to the FAQ page. There is a highlight on the FAQ page. Of course there is. One of the questions of the FAQ, does this program work with blind children? Oh. The answer Yes, there is every possibility that we can deliver this program to children who've lost their sight. However, we've not yet conducted a study and will endeavor to update this information when appropriate. What? So like in theory, (laughs) she could teach blind kids how to see without using their eyes. She just hasn't gotten around to that bit yet. Right. She's not quite there. (laughs) Like she could have. Nicola, do you want to, Nicola Farmer, do you want to help these teach these blind kids to basically be daredevil? Mm, Maybe later. I've just got some cards that need read from a a roughly 35 degree angle by some cocky (laughs) six six year olds. I need some help fighting the Dawn dish detergent. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, and I have to say again, so like apparently like people are fooled by this shit all over the world, right? We go to Germany. And we see that there's people in Germany that also buy into this nonsense. One group do it as, a, as part of their martial arts training. And one thing I love about that is that they say the training is the main thing. The being able to see is just a side effect, which is true in the sense that they achieve the effect by looking out the side. That's all they're doing. It literally is a side effect. <laughs> well, what's amazing to me is they show these kids doing their blindfolded training and then they're interviewing them afterwards without the blindfolded. And one of the kids is wearing glasses. Like, give me a fucking <laughs> break. <laughs> give me a But you're making this too goddamn easy for me. And then I guess we go to the birthplace of pretending the blindfold is on properly, uh, which is uh, Moscow. <laughs> Right, <laughs> where all the best science comes from. We we hear from the founder who assures us, as that FAQ page did, that this even works with blind kids, which is just terrifying to think. Like again, these people are selling this to the parents of blind children, saying they can cure it with their magic. Yeah, yeah absolutely, fucking disgusting. It's, it's awful. But yeah, she, but this uh, lady explains to us how it works in very broken English, and then they they insist that they did this. You know, they did science with real scientists about this, right? And they do this experiment where they like check to make sure there's no light can be seen from inside the blindfold and then prove that it's all uh, legit. But then you see the person who they've done that on very clearly peeking out the side. And I wrote, is this movie gaslighting us? (laughs) It can't be because they've established that light can't get in through the mask. So I guess it isn't gaslighting (laughs) us. (laughs) Yes. This is the point where they go to this Italian scientist and they talk to the Italian scientist for quite a while. And I don't know if you noticed this, but they dubbed him. Yes. He's speaking fucking English the whole way through, but they dubbed him anyway. American audience, Alice. Well, but they didn't even dub him with a a native English speaker. The guy doing the dubbing also has as thick of an accent as he does. It's so fucking weird. Yeah. But so, okay. And then Carolyn takes this bullshit back to her very nearly blind friend. Oh, this is so rough. Yes. This is so, so rough. It's like having hung around with a bunch of frauds, I decided to cure someone who wasn't going to lie and pretend about it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, man, so that was bad. fucking sad. So yeah, so we see this lady who's, whose eyesight is so bad, she's got to use a, a magnifying glass to read menus and stuff. But she, you know, explains that her doctors told her she would never get her sight back. So she decided to Tell them doctors to go fuck themselves and support con artists instead. (laughs) And again, I don't blame her for this, right? Like, I understand if you're you're told there's no hope by one group and you're told there is hope by another group. I see why you tend towards that latter group. It's the group that is the bad guy here. I want to make that super clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
but they're going to like they're going to give her a series of lessons in how to see blindfolded. <gasps> and what's funny is we get to watch this progression of like because it's obviously like, all right, well, we're just going to keep doing this until you start faking it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the first instructor, like the instructor in the first lesson, you can see her feeling out how to say just fake it. Right. Without being too uh, obvious about it. Because at one point, the instructor tells her, so I want you to look around the mask. I want you to look around in the mask. It's like, yeah, that's <laughs> literally the whole trick. You could have stopped the, the whole lesson. Yeah, right. There. Yes. So she's like, no, like, look around in the mask and eventually <laughs> you'll see things. I don't know how I could be seeing this any, saying this any clearer. <laughs> She says, yeah, well, you know, at, for, at first I just saw spots and stars. I could see the whole universe. And I'm like, no, only the half in front of you. The other half is completely <laughs> invisible. Uh, but that's not enough. So, yeah, you can see the whole universe. You can't see the color of the paper that they're holding up. You can't see that, though. We can't zoom in yet. Yeah, you have to learn to zoom in. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing lights is literally a symptom of some conditions, particularly those that affect the eyes as well, though. But like, OK, oh, wow. this is magic because she can see spots and, and lights and things. Oh, my God. That's so awful. Yeah. So, yeah. So we see it. session one. She doesn't get any of the colors right. Session two, she gets one of them correct. Right. So they're mm. like they're holding up shit. They're having her hold up pieces of paper and she'll go blue. And they're like, nope, not that one. <laughs> uh, of course, we only see the one that she gets right. We get a one second clip of an entire second session. I don't know how long that lesson was. I think it was probably more than one second long. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In session three, she she specifically says to her, set your focus as a periscope and the woman adjusts her mask. Like I'm sure yes. in all the content we're not seeing, she's been told how to like adjust the mask so she can see a particular thing. And she calls that set your focus as a periscope. Yeah, oh, it's so good. And then we, we get towards the end where clearly the instructor has given up trying to get them to cheat and so she's yes. just going to cheat her, for herself because she's like okay I'm, I'm going to hold up a piece of paper you tell me what colour it is and they're like yeah blue and she's like hang on hang on scrabble 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 around for a piece of paper <laughs> yes. it was blue yes. she finds a blue piece of paper to hold up <laughs> she starts lifting she's holding up the papers after the subject makes her fucking guess it's crazy it's Dr. <laughs> Vinkman at the beginning of Ghostbusters it's yeah. just nonsense but then they say like, you know, oh, well, you know, she has, she can see all the colors now. It only took three sessions. Her blindness is fixed. She doesn't even need to use the magnifying glass anymore to read. Trust us. Just trust us on this one. And then how she comes away from this, because she comes away, like the Kim, she comes away feeling happy that this was successful. And what she learns is that she was writing too small on pieces of paper when she was trying to read her writing. So now she can write on a piece of paper and read it. And she just writes bigger. And she shows us, like, if I write it really big and then hold it close to my face, I can read it now. It's like, yeah, I, I don't think that's the solution to your problems. This is not the panacea. This is not 100% success, if you ask me. Yeah. yeah, and it certainly isn't magical. She's just genuinely come to terms with the need to make reasonable adjustments for herself, which she's now making and can live her life more comfortably, which is great, but it's not fucking magic. No, it's yeah. not superhuman. Yeah. So, okay. So, but then Carolyn wraps up by explaining that Scientists don't know everything. <laughs> so, she's like, you know, scientists say that the laws of physics are immutable, but we've been breaking them left and right on this documentary, right? <laughs> so, yeah. It's, if the current scientific laws of physical reality were complete, they shouldn't ever be broken. It's like, well, no, but then also no. Like, yep. you aren't breaking them, but they're also not complete. That's not how that works either. Right. Exactly. But yeah, but she explains that if you believe God exists and God does exist, it doesn't work like that with rocks that are in front of you or any, any measurable thing, but only immeasurable stuff like God, right? She says at one point, who's more powerful, you or the physical world? I'm like, yeah, hard to see how that could go wrong. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she says, um, if you can influence an electrical device, she's like, I definitely fucking can. I'm doing it right this moment. I'm speaking and this electrical device yeah. is reacting to my voice. I can see the waveforms on audacity and everything. It's magic. <laughs> I've got ma if you got magic influence. powers. And you're not even touching it. <gasps> yeah, <laughs> right. And she doesn't even specify that, right? Like she doesn't even say without touching it. So like if you can hit the on switch, then you're magical. <laughs> <laughs> Some guy comes in and his closing thought is, well, you know, what's more important to you? The nice car that you own or the memories you make with your family? And we're like, oh, yeah, no, the memories. He's like, therefore, your car doesn't exist. And we're like, wait, what? 
<laughs> yeah. It's like, just be nice and make nice choices. Otherwise, you'll mess up the quantum field is what they're arguing <laughs> <Yes>. for. Yes. <laughs> Fucking what? And this is where uh, Michael Dorn comes up and his opening line is, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Fucked if I know, Wolf. <laughs> right. <laughs> But he's like, you know, it's all about love. And I'm like, oof, that is nearly the closing thought of this stupid movie. <laughs> While they're talking about love, I feel like the people who put in the stock footage in have just given up entirely because there's just a random close up shot of a camera like walking into a Nick's makeup shop, which has absolutely <laughs> no relevance to anything going on. Well, because she loves doing that. That's what Carol is doing. <laughs> Of love. Yeah, no, and, and uh, they explain that the purpose of the universe is us. I'm like, oh, that's that's not arrogant. It's us atheists are the arrogant ones, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. And then her last line is, she goes, are you a superhuman? And we all wrote in our notes, no. <laughs> I'm just, like, Hell, man, my, my heart can barely pump through my coronary arteries. Come on, I'm de definitely not superhuman. <laughs> All right. Well, Marsh, Alice, I cannot thank you enough for dropping in and lending your expertise to this one. And uh, here's hoping it's the least pleasant thing you have to do for the rest of the year. Oh, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, if you want to hear more from this week's guest, be sure to check out Skeptics with a K. It's one of the most entertaining and informative podcasts on the internet. You can find it linked in the show notes for this episode. And while that does it for our review of Superhuman, that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to step into the same mud puddle next week. Eli's not here. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and tell you what's on deck. It is The Shift. I don't know anything about it except that it's from the people that brought you Sound of Freedom and that I got to go to the theaters to watch it. So with that to look forward to, remembering episode 432 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Michael Marshall and Dr. Alice Howarth for all their help today. And a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that helped make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn only access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Data, D&D &D Minus, and The Skeptocrat, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Tim Robson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slapping with the on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bostick, I'm Illusions. Promise to work harder, earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. Caroline Corey declared herself a superhero for her ability to slowly rotate tinfoil <laughs> and instantly became the most interesting character in the DCU. Fair, fair. The upcoming X-Men movie just added based on a true story to their title cards. The blindfolded British kid went on to use his skills in lying to enter British politics and became the next Tory Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs>